that he had some understanding of uh, the uh, state of our planning and what uh, possibilities existed, not specific options, but a range of, of possibilities that uh, he should he should consider as he thought about this in the course of his trip to Aspen and back. And the president and I discussed it at length going out to, uh, to Aspen and especially the significance of what had happened uh, more than simply one country invading another little country. That what, what did it all really mean? President Mr. Thatcher admits in Ambassador Cato's wrong, perhaps a slightly unlikely place, uh, tucked up in the hills 10 miles outside Aspen. It was a, a relaxed uh, meeting, a large room, comfortable room, just the President and Mrs. Thatcher and General Scowcroft, and, and I was there too. The President was ready for what Mrs. Thatcher came with, which was the same idea that this that this is more than just another case of a border incursion or something. This has great significance. So there was a meeting of mind and two, they were both heading in the same direction and they tended to reinforce each other. It's been said that Mrs. Thatcher had to put backbone into the prison. That's just wrong. I mean, they both arrived there absolutely determined that this was something which could not be tolerated. I think the, the genuine sense of outrage was the thing I remember most strikingly on the part of both of them that this should have happened. I think also a slight feeling of history, a, a memory of what had happened when in the 1930s we had failed to move to protect small countries when they had been invaded. Iraq's invasion of Kuwait defies every principle for which the United Nations stands. If we let it succeed, no small country can ever feel safe again. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. President Bush gave a midday speech that day, which uh, ironically involved the Middle East. The strategic essence was to change the focus of our defense planning from a global war with the Soviet Union to dealing with regional conflicts. And in fact, in our secret planning, the, the regional conflicts that were of the greatest concern were in the Persian Gulf, like in Iraqi invasion of Saudi Arabia. This had been planned to be a major unveiling of a new defense strategy, but of course no one noticed in all the other things going on. The brutal aggression launched last night against Kuwait illustrates my central thesis. Notwithstanding the alteration in the Soviet threat, the world remains a dangerous place with serious threats to important U.S. interests wholly unrelated to the earlier patterns of the U.S.-Soviet relationship. If I haven't done as clear a job as I might, on explaining this, then I got to do better in that regard. Because I know in my heart of hearts that what we are doing is right. You had the three senior people at the meeting besides the president. You had you know, Brent Scowcroft, Larry Edelberger, and Dick Cheney. Each gave a several minute statement at the beginning. I had told the president that I was, I was concerned and I thought we had to get over the significance of this in the world that we were that we were living in, and that if he didn't mind, I would do what I don't usually do at NSC meetings, and that is open the meeting with a statement of the of the larger significance of this. And uh, and he said, well, maybe I should do that. And and I remember saying, no, I think it's better that I do, and you sit back and let the debate develop. So so that's what I did, and and try to set it in a, in a broader stage of the overall significance to U.S. vital interests of what had happened. I told President Bush <clears throat> what was brought home by Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait was that uh, he did not have to take Saudi Arabia in order to dominate the Gulf. Once he had Kuwait, he had uh, some 20% of the world's oil reserves, and he had the largest army in the neighborhood. He was in a position to dictate policy to everybody else in the Gulf. The general thrust of what I said, which was, again, uh, after working it out with Bob, was essentially that, Mr. President, this is a far more important issue than simply the invasion of Kuwait, important as that is. This is, in its own way, the first real test of this new world order that we're trying to put together. And if, it is, if this aggression is permitted to proceed, uh, it sets a whole, all the wrong standards for that new world order. 
it sends messages to the Qaddafi, the Kim Il-sungs, etc., that, if you will, with the collapse of the bipolar world, with the removal of one of the two superpowers, uh, in fact, perhaps the rules of the game have changed and the pipsqueaks like Saddam Hussein can do more rather than less because they aren't constrained by their big brother. And under these circumstances, it's absolutely essential that the U.S. collectively, if possible, but individually, if necessary, uh, not only put a stop to this aggression, but roll it back. He's a large geopolitical state. Well, you know, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> However you assess the stakes, this was going to be a turning point. It was the first test of what you might call the post-Cold War era, and everybody knew that there was just a sense, a palpable sense of history in the room. Is, is it your sense on the third that the president was sharing these views as expressed? Well, very much so. The only re reason the president held back, I think, based on everything I know from the day, was that once the president speaks at a meeting, it, it certainly sets the tone and it, it can inhibit what other people are prepared to say. You might say. You might say. <laughs> Did this open up the possibilities for what came to be called a new world order? On this episode, our American Enterprise Institute panel is led by Richard Pearl. There was always the tension between when you used the United Nations and when you went to the United Nations and when you didn't. We could have done it alone, we could have done it with what we had, but you had to think of this not just as a narrow exercise, but as trying to keep together this large coalition for purposes down the road that might even be more ambitious. It was quite obvious and sort of dramatically obvious that if you were going to conduct an offensive option uh, responsibly, you had to have more force there. <laughs> What you're doing is very important because it sends a message that this is a new era, it is a new world. The United States and the Soviet Union are cooperating. The UN is working again. But there are still bad people in the world. Mr. Hussein, Saddam Hussein, is a bad person. I was confident that once, uh, reasonably confident, I should say, that once U.S. forces began to arrive and the American flag was planted in the desert, he would have to think twice. He might still decide to gamble. But at that point, uh, a little colorful kind of language I used in the privacy of my office, he was pulling on Superman's cape. On the next episode, U.S. troops move into the Persian Gulf by the thousands. Intense negotiations continue, but Saddam Hussein refuses to back down in New World Order. Part two of our three-part series of The Gulf Crisis, The Road to War. Order your collector's edition video of all three programs of The Gulf Crisis series on video cassette by calling 1-800-544-1803. Have your Visa or MasterCard ready. Operators are standing by. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. Peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order, can emerge. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is a very real prospect of a new world order. The Council on Foreign... It's a new world order they're trying to create.